Yeah, hi guys. Uh, my name is Arnav Baniwala. I was I graduated from Stanford University in 2017. Stayed on to do a master's, which I finished in 2019. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and since then I've been working as a I've been f founding my own startup in uh, the Bay Area called High Tide Intelligence. So mm -hmm. uh, yep, yeah, and so yep, yeah, that's who I am. Yeah. So how did you get into Stanford? Uh, yeah, so uh, like all top universities, uh, to get into a place like Stanford, you need, uh, you know, you obviously need good grades, but more than that, you need to show that you're a, you know, show that you're an intellectually curious person who will, you know, ultimately contribute to the community on campus. And so the way I tried to show that was that, you know, I showed that I was passionate about certain, you know, very unique things. So for me, that was science and the outdoors and I made sure that my application reflected that interest because I really wanted to study physics. And, uh, you know, I still ended up doing a master's in geophysics, actually. So it was kind of like a convergence of both of those interests. So getting into Stanford basically meant, uh, you know, getting decent grades. Uh, they don't have to be the best, but, you know, they have to be good enough. Uh, <clears throat> working on proper extracurricular. So I did a bunch of uh, I did a bunch of projects, did some research at TIFR in the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research between my 11th and 12th standard. And, you know, worked on a couple of other uh, extracurricular projects that were kind of at the intersection of science and outdoors and environment and, you know, a bunch of other interests that I had. Uh, I made sure my essays were very well written. So, you know, I worked pretty, I worked pretty hard on them, probably more than all other parts of my application. And uh, also made sure that they were all, you know, tied together so that it was kind of like they were one big uh, one. It was like kind of like one package coming together that showed exactly who I was. And, you know, after a point, it's also just a matter of luck. Uh, these universities are very selective. Uh, when I was accepted to Stanford, the acceptance rate was about 5%. Uh, I think three years after that, it went down to 4% and still somewhere around there. So, uh, you know, a lot of there is at the end of the day, a lot of luck because there's a ton of qualified people applying and it honestly can just come down to, you know, how your admission of, admissions officer is feeling when they read your application. It can come down to, you know, what uh, balance of different uh, backgrounds or interests they want in the class that year and so on. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of like the long and short of it. You know, you get decent, good enough grades. Uh, you have to like really show that you're, that you're uh, unique and interesting and that you're going to, you know, uh, bring something you know, really interesting to campus. And then you have to make sure you're presenting yourself very, very well in the way you structure your application and your essays. And oh yeah, and I almost forgot this, but it's important to have good recommendations from your teachers and, you know, any external like mentors or whoever, because it's getting somebody to vouch for you and basically put place a reputation on the line for you, which is a very powerful thing uh, mm -hmm. for not just for college applications, but in general. So that's kind of like the broadly how I got in. I can get into specifics as well. So what did you study there? Sorry, what do you say? What did you study there? Yeah, so in undergrad, I majored in physics with a minor in history. And in my uh, master's, I did, a, I did a master's in geophysics. Specifically, I was studying uh climate change risk in coastal areas and how to uh quantify what that risk is like and plan for it uh in undergrad i came in wanting to study astrophysics specifically and uh you know one year to become like an academic like a like a professional like an academic or a professional you know physicist or scientist halfway through stanford i realized that astrophysics was not the uh not what i thought it was it was a very different field from what i'd imagined and not honestly not exciting uh, but I'd always grown in, always been really interested in energy and environment issues, especially with you know, uh, you know, being like an outdoors guy before and seeing uh, climate change affect you know the mountains, affect uh, you know environmental degradation, affect the senior Bombay where I grew up. So I grew very passionate about that. I started diving deeper into it and ended up, you know, technically still majoring in physics, but doing a lot of stuff focused on energy systems and environmental systems. So classes on fluid mechanics and geophysics, uh, classes on, you know, energy systems, some civil engineering and applied physics classes along that as along with that as well. So that was a cool thing about Stanford. There was a lot of flexibility mm -hmm. to do many uh, different things. Even if your major wasn't one thing, you still were able, to, I was still able to, you know, take classes and study and, you know, build relationships across a big uh, variety of uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm. So what are your school strengths? 
uh, what are Stanford strengths? You mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, so everyone, you know, considers Stanford to be one of the best, you know, if not the best universities in the world. Uh, what is, to me, what does that what does that actually mean? Is that you know, you know, there's obviously world class academics, uh, but to me, the stuff that really sticks out that I don't think any other university has one is the uh, kind of the diversity of the student body in, in terms of interests and backgrounds. Uh, and the amount of resources that are invested into students. So I'll talk about the first the first point I raised about uh, student body diversity first. And what that means is that at any top college, you're going to find a lot of very smart, very motivated, very hardworking people. But at Stanford, mm -hmm. there's always been a tradition of finding people who like to, you know, think outside the box, be curious, be quirky, be you know eccentric in certain ways, and you know do very unique and interesting things. As a result, it's kind of like just part of the culture. And so you'll find, you know, your standard, you know, very smart kids who are going to, you know, go and say, go into business and do well. Kids who, are <clears throat> kids who are, you know, really motivated by academics and who might become like professors or, uh, you know, like intellectuals in their own right. Uh, kids who are really passionate about, uh, but you also find a lot of kids who are very passionate about building things and becoming entrepreneurs, people who have been, you know, athletes and played at the highest level of their sport and kind of bring a whole different perspective because of that. Uh, you'll find a lot of people who are, you know, passionate about policy and government and a lot of people who are passionate about activism and social justice and social service. So you'll find a very interesting mix of people. And I think there's always a, you know, slightly weird streak. Like I had, a, you know, I had a bunch of friends who, uh, you know, just have very unique interests. Uh, like one of them, for example, is obsessed with architecture and urbanism and just has just has a real depth of knowledge that uh, very few people I know have. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's and. You know, my freshman year roommate, for example, was a is an Olympic level water polo player. Uh, and then, you know, there's always like a few people in your class who've started and sold companies before they've, uh, you know, before they've even started, before they finished high school. And then mm -hmm. along with that, there were people I knew uh, who, you know, this like made, who, you know, discovered new kinds, new asteroids or comets and had done really, really insane uh, astrophysics research before coming in. So. You find a really great mix of people, a really, uh, a really like curious uh, group of people, and a really like you know just uh, excite. And there's just a lot of excitement and energy that comes from having that awesome mix of people there. So that's like number the first reason. The second reason is around the resources that are spent on students. So uh, Stanford is a very rich university. Uh, I think only Harvard and Yale have bigger endowments. But uh, this is anecdotal, but uh, I've had friends who've you know, gone to Harvard for grad school and done Stanford undergrad. And they, you know, they always said, hey, we were always able to you know, get access to grant funding or you know, like projects or the clubs we were running were able to get a lot of funding from the university because they really do like to invest in students. And so what that means is that if, if you have an idea for a project, whether it's you know, uh, you know, like just building something cool on campus or uh, you know, doing humanities research in Morocco or something. That's something one of my friends actually did. It's mm -hmm. you know, it's very possible to get resources for that. Uh, I was able to benefit benefit from that in a big way because when I was thinking of starting my you know my uh, company after graduation, uh, mm -hmm. I was still you know trying to figure out how we were going to get funding because it was very early stage. And so mm -hmm. there's a center at Stanford called the Tomcat Center for Sustainable Energy that ended up giving us a pretty significant grant to you know spin out the company and get it started so there's a lot of stuff like there's a whole ecosystem of resources and expertise that's uh there basically to serve students and help with their projects and so on so uh those are two are like really big strengths and then you know on top of that there's still world-class academics in pretty much every field uh, there's a lot of research opportunities uh it's a very like the campus culture is very fun it's like competitive but laid back at the same time so people are really encouraged to be the best version of themselves rather than engage in cutthroat competition and uh so that's what really like why i love the place and why i think it was a great university university to go to so what was your freshman experience like my freshman experience yeah uh, yeah, my freshman experience was it was quite a lot of fun. I mean, I did a program called uh, Structured Liberal Education or SLE. It was kind of like a, what they call like a what like a quote unquote great books program, uh, and so that means that you spend an entire year uh, studying the <clears throat> there's some classic the classic uh, classical books of uh, of you know like Western Western and you know some like uh, Eastern literature as well. 
And what was cool about that also was that uh, the hundred or so of us who were doing that program all lived in the same dorm as well and had classes over there. So we, you know, we formed a really tight community and a lot of my closest friends from Stanford came from SLE as well. Along with that, I, you know, I did a lot of uh, extracurriculars. So I was on the debate team that year. Uh, that year, I also joined the Stanford Model UN conference and, you know, helped organize it uh, and then also helped organize it for my sophomore year. I volunteered for uh, an outdoors group called the Stanford Outdoor Outreach Program. We take kids from like an underprivileged area and take them hiking, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, so and I then so I did a lot of that. Uh, and then I also, you know, did uh, physics research the summer between my freshman and sophomore year. So uh, making it sound great, uh, and we all, obviously also we partied a little bit, but uh, that's for that's a whole other story. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. I also got like also the first class I ever took was taught by a guy named Stephen Chu, who's a Nobel laureate and former U.S. Secretary of Energy. So, you know, having access to someone with that profile and who's, you know, one of the probably one of the smartest people on the planet was just very surreal. Uh, so that was all the good stuff. There were some hard times in it as well. Uh, there is always going to be an adjustment period to university because you're living on your own for the first time. And you're also in a foreign country. So there's a little bit of culture shock as well. Uh, so that did take a bit, uh, you know, it did take a little bit of adjustment and all of that. Uh, on top of that, I had a, I injured myself while trying to learn how to ski uh, in that my freshman winter. So uh, that definitely, you know, did impact uh, my ability to, you know, just like make use of everything over there. But all said and done, it was a pretty, it was a pretty good year. It was a hard year in some ways, but also a very fulfilling time overall. Hmm. So how many hours did you study at Stanford? How many hours? Uh, good question. <laughs> I honestly don't remember fully because I graduated on undergrad a couple of three years ago now, I guess. But uh, yeah, I studied. I mean, it was one of those things where I would let's see, I would take on, you would take on average between 15 to 18 units, units of class and one unit of class is equivalent to like, you know, like one hour of lecture plus maybe two hours on top of that of uh, yeah, like, you know, homework, like at least that's what it's supposed to be. So I'd say per week I would do like, uh, per week I would do like 50, 60 hours, give or take, like some weeks when there was, wasn't that much homework or projects due or midterms, it would be less, other weeks it would be more. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty significant. It was pretty significant. I'd say overall on average, it came out to like, at least like around five, like with class, it came to like anywhere between five to eight hours a day, plus doing a lot of extracurriculars and then also trying to have, you know, a social life and have time to just chill and, you know, like watch Netflix or just hang out with your friends, that kind of thing. So yeah, it was always a very busy time. I'd say the one difference going from uh, high school to uh, university is that in high school your schedule is set for you and it's a very rigid schedule right like you wake up at a certain time you go to class you go to school your periods are all laid out for you and then after that you you, know, you go home do homework and then sleep at maybe maybe like play around a bit or whatever and then sleep by whatever time uh in college it can be like at and it can be anywhere you want like we routinely, routinely have meetings for some of the clubs I was running or for the Stanford Daily where I used to work as an editor and an opinions columnist for, uh, we'd have meetings going to like very late at night, like, you know, midnight or something, or we'd be start working on have study group meetings late at night as well. So it can, it can be pretty, it can be pretty uh, varied. And so that makes a big difference in terms of, uh, you know, how much work you actually end up doing. So what are some of the most popular clubs and student organizations? Would it be possible for a freshman to start his own student organization? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of student groups at Stanford. I mean, uh, I can talk about the ones I was involved in. Actually, I think that'll be more insightful. So I was really, uh, so I love, I enjoyed writing and photography quite a bit. So I used to work for the Stanford Daily from my sophomore year onwards. Uh, and initially I started off as a photographer and then like as a photo editor. And then, uh, I had to become a writer because one time I went to pho photograph an event, the writer for some reason couldn't show up. So I ended up writing that story, becoming a right bit of a, a writer as well. From there, I became a news, uh, news editor. And, uh, for after that, my senior year, I worked as an opinion column columnist there. So I had a column come out every other week where I just wrote about different issues. 
so the Stanford Daily was one club. It's a pretty popular one. It was a lot of fun. Really great to be part of it. The other club was the Stanford Energy Club. So I joined it when I was a junior because I was really passionate about uh, you know energy and environment, and I figured this was a great way to get involved in that whole industry and learn about what was going on in it. And so uh, that was pretty great. We it was more when I joined it, it was mostly graduate students. There were very few undergrads in it. And out of the nine of us on leadership that year, I think only two of us were undergrads. Uh, and then when I, uh, you know, finished finished uh, my first year in it, where I was running their digital and marketing team. Uh, after that, I think there was like it was kind of like became 50-50 undergrads to graduate students. And then when I was in graduate school again, I rejoined it as co-president, and we grew it to be a pretty big organization. I think there's over 2,000 students and faculty and staff uh, within the broader like community now. And uh, we have like a huge event every. We have a couple of huge events every year that have like uh, you know three to five hundred, three to five hundred people give or take. Uh, so those are the ones I was most involved in. There's a lot of other like really like well-known groups. Like a lot of my friends joined uh, acapella groups, uh, you know, which are like you know like kind of like music groups. Uh, my brother, who's uh, just graduated from Stanford class of 2020, uh, he's he used to run this one organization called Basis, which was an which was the main entrepreneurship society over there so a lot of like high profile entrepreneurs have come out of it uh along with that there's a lot of like club sports teams uh that you know people were part of and a lot of other like music and arts groups i was also part of the debate team my freshman and sophomore years and the model un uh conference freshman and sophomore year so uh yeah there's a ton of groups as well but a group for pretty much anything and if you want to start one it's very simple too i knew plenty of people freshman year who started different organizations or publications and uh, you know a lot of them have actually like been going, so it's very easy. It's pretty easy to start that, and there's always a lot of university support to help you out in that, in terms of getting funding for it, mm -hmm. or in terms of finding mentors and so on. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was it's pretty easy to do it, and it's a very you know, it's a very vibrant place. So it's uh, it was pretty great for that. So what kind of things are there to do in your school's hometown? In power, oh, so it's, yeah, so Stanford's interesting. It's uh, it's technically its own uh, like city or like uh, like its own area, so to speak. So your address will always say Stanford, California, but the closest mm -hmm. town to it is a town called uh, Palo Alto. Uh, mm -hmm. There's quite there's a decent amount of stuff to do around there. I mean, Stanford campus is huge, so there's always stuff happening on campus. You know, there's a lot of like you know maybe like student parties or. Uh, Beyond that, uh, you know, like a lot of just activities happening, a lot of film screenings and things like that. Uh, you know, a lot of like clubs have events, that kind of thing. And then on top of that, there's also like a few places which have which will have concerts or live music. There's a lot of houses that are called what you call uh, co-op houses, where they'll have like you know like arts things happening or they'll have a band playing, that kind of thing. Uh, there's a really great coffee house on campus and. A great place for like um, Mexican Indian fusion food called the Treehouse, and also that's a great place to drink beer uh, as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Then Palo Alto, the town. I mean, there's uh, there's a, there's some stuff to do over there. It's a relatively small town, but the thing with mm -hmm. Stanford is that you're in Silicon Valley, right? You're in the Bay Area, and so there's a lot of stuff to do within the Bay Area because you're very close to San Francisco, which is a really big and vibrant city. There's a lot of outdoor stuff, so I that was great for me because I loved hiking. Uh, I grew up doing sailing as well in Bombay. So there's a, there's like sail, the Stanford has a boathouse in Redwood City you can go sailing from. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you're, uh, if you're looking to like a lot of people I knew and I myself did internships uh, during the summer of the school year around with like tech companies and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of that around as well. So in terms of career stuff, in terms of just, you know, having having fun and like going to San Francisco or something, there's a lot of that happening. And I still live in the Bay Area, partly because I really just love the area and uh, stay and, uh, you know, just loved uh, living over here. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's also so, great food everywhere, I will say that. <laughs> what is your favorite place to eat? Uh, well, I cook a lot, actually, and I'm a very, and even though I say it myself, I'm a very good cook. So I'll, and so because of COVID, I've been eating at home a lot more, but there's a ton of really good restaurants around here. Uh, two like concepts that I didn't know about before coming to San Francisco because there's a you know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, Asian people in the Bay Area. Uh, one mm -hmm. of those things was uh, you like uh, what they call hot pot, and the other one is Korean barbecue. So it's just like you know you take a bunch of your friends and you go to this one restaurant where you have like for hot pot you have like a big uh, 
like you have like a the table has a hot plate in it and on that they have this bo big bowl full of like soup and you like cook like meat and vegetables in the soup and like communally uh, and then it's just a big like just a good like kind of like a fun party and korean barbecue is similar but instead of a bowl of soup it's like there's a grill over there so those are two of my favorite things because you know you just eat a lot and it's all very tasty and you have a good time and then on top of that i love like, eating like sushi uh, there's a lot of good indian food around as well uh, a lot of good pizza as well and oh yeah and big being in california you have extremely good uh, mexican food too so uh, yeah you get pretty much any kind of food you want over here and i personally miss hot pot and korean barbecue quite a bit because during uh, covid a lot of those places are shut down but it's just a great time to go out with a few friends and you know demolish a big plate of mm, big plate of food there so is it safe area to walk around at night but yeah like safe? Yeah, Stanford campus itself is very safe. Uh, like it's you know it's kind of like a city unto itself, so it's not like there's you know you're not going to find very rarely going to find random people going in and out. Uh, students in general also tend to be a lot more vigilant about it. So like for example, uh, you know, a lot of students will be partying on the weekends on uh, the main like uh, what they call frat row, even though there's not that many fraternity houses there. But that's where all the parties happen, and so there's a group on campus called Five Shore that. uh you know basically uh, some students will volunteer with them and they'll set up stations at every block where you know in case someone's been drinking too much they have uh bottles of water and snacks uh you know if someone looks like they're a bit uh you know like lost or you know might have you know, been drinking too much or something they'll help you get home safely all of that so yeah mm -hmm. it's a pretty safe area all said and done like uh there's you know there's a pretty safe area all said and done uh and you're not going to it's very unlikely for there to be crime any crime happening on campus so what are dorms like and how is the food what are dorms like uh yes yeah, so the dorms so the dorms are actually quite uh, quite nice all said and done like when we when you're there you complain about them a little bit because you know you get thoda you get thoda puck out by living in a dorm but the dorms are pretty great uh there uh i think when you're a, i think they're changing the system for assigning students now but when i was there you could they would randomly put you uh wherever you wanted when you were a wherever they wanted when you were a freshman and uh, you could either be with uh and be in what they call in you could dial list your preferences and they'd like match them first and then randomly put you with a roommate or whoever but the dorms are pretty nice for the most part uh they built some new ones as well which kind of look like their hotels or something they're very good uh some of them and uh, after that you can whenever you go to another dorm after that they'll put you through a housing lottery and from there you'll go to the you can go to another one uh so along with like standard dorms uh i lived in florence moore hall my freshman year it was a great time uh but my senior year i lived in a house called slavyanski dorm and mm -hmm. that was a house smaller uh, smaller than a dorm or not dorm typically has about 100 or people and Slav uh, is one of the houses on uh, May on this one street over there called Mayfield Avenue, and a lot of these houses are very small, like you know, like forty, fifty people tops, and they have a theme around it. So Slav had a Slavic culture themed theme. So you have uh, along with the RAs, you have a couple of students who will basically you know cre have event create events for the house to you know make students get deeper into Slavic culture, and we should do it just do a lot of things as a house together, like you know we'd. go to this one russian uh, spa slash bath house in san francisco every quarter called banya which was a lot of fun and then go to a russian restaurant after one of my friends who was uh, in star staff for the house would have like a movie night uh, you know movie night where he'd show russian films and we'd discuss them you know every week another friend would have like you know we'd build, would build a fire in the back backyard and then we would all like you know get some like cocoa or like tea or something and come sit around the fire and talk about russian politics and you know that kind of thing so it was uh, yeah so that's another kind of uh, that's another kind of dorm you can live in even though it's more like a house and we were all went that was really nice because i'm still very good friends with everybody who i lived with over there uh food wise the food in the dorms is actually very good uh i think my the my freshman year like the dorm i lived there florence moor hall just had a lot of variety they had like indian food every sunday which actually turned out to be pretty good uh mm -hmm. they would uh yeah like all said and done i mean for indian american food i guess uh there was like usually very high quality if you want to eat healthy they have like a ton of options 
Uh, and that's kind of consistent throughout campus. Like they have a lot of dining hall, dining halls everywhere. And if you want something different, I mean, it's pretty, uh, pretty easy to get to get some other stuff. So there's a few restaurants on campus that, uh, so there's a ton of restaurants on campus as well, all over. So, you know, if you have class in say the engineering quad, there's like a great sandwich spot over near there called Ike's. There's a great cafe that has like three locations on campus called Koopa Cafe. And overall, so I'd say it's very high quality in California. You get very good quality uh, food in general, like especially like, you know, fresh like fruits and vegetables. So if you're, if you like that, then it's pretty, it's pretty great overall. So what are some of the most traditional, most popular traditional events at campus? Uh, yeah, there's quite a few. So there's, uh, so like during orientation, they have this thing happening called band run where the band literally like, you know, will round up all the freshmen from the dorms when, and, uh, you know, like make you, uh, run through campus and end up in the quad. And then, you know, the band, like, you know, does its, does its own crazy thing. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, fountain hopping is another big tradition. So there's 25 fountains on Stanford's campus. And so you, uh, basically you go with a group of friends, you know, get a cooler filled with drinks or something and usually like a boom box and just jump in each fountain when the weather's nice. And, uh, you know, like you jump in one fountain, you have some fun, you move on to the next fountain and you just make a whole day of it. That's a lot of fun. Uh, there's one tradition called full moon on the quad where, uh, during the traditionally during the first full moon of fall quarter, you, uh, all the students gather in the quad. And then when midnight strikes, you know, you can just, you just kiss other students, I guess. Uh, so that one's like, the, that one's a little infamous as well, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. Along with that, uh, I'm trying to think of what other, trying to think of some others. Uh, Stanford actually, like for most uh, top university in the, in the U.S. are really bad at sports, but Stanford is the one exception. And so the football games are a lot of fun, are a lot of fun because the Stanford football team, except for last year, was doing quite well. So they have a lot of, uh, so, you know, going to a football game is actually, is actually great. Even if you don't know anything about American football, like I did, like I didn't know anything before joining. So, uh, those are all like great traditions too. And, uh. I'm trying to think of a few other. I'm trying to think of a few others because it's been a while since undergrad, and I don't remember all of them. But uh, yeah, we uh, yeah, like uh, one like oh, yeah, like one other one uh, is going steam tunneling, which is harder to do now because they closed off some of the steam tunnels on campus. But uh, basically, you find a couple of these underground steam tunnels that go throughout the campus where, and you're like, yeah, you like steam for heating and cooling buildings. And so you, the, I, the tradition is that in the middle of winter, when it's cold at night, you open up one of the little like entrances to it, you sneak in and then you just run through it while trying not to hit the pipes because the pipes are very hot, but it's like nice and warm and it's a good time. Uh, yeah, those are all fun. Uh, we also, I also used to take a class up at the student observatory. So sometimes at night, my friends and I would just sneak up there and, you know, it would just be a great place to just look at the stars, just look at the view. It's like really awesome. Uh, so those are a lot of, those are like some of most of the, some of the traditions I can think of. If I think of any more during this call, I'll bring them up as well. But it's been a while since I did a lot of these, uh, just cause you know, it was a long time ago. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. The best, the best one, the best one is one called wacky walk. So that's during graduation. So everybody dresses up in a funny outfit during mm -hmm. graduation and, uh, like runs into the stadium wearing their funny outfit. So like mm -hmm. Maya, for example, uh, my friends and I all dressed up as the Berlin Wall, and we had one friend pretend to be, uh, like you know, Ronald Reagan, and we ran in, and he would scream, "Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall!" And so we ran into the stadium, and then when he would scream that, we would just, uh, uh, we would just like you know, fall down as if the Berlin Wall was falling. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Like, could you see stars in 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 midnight? So, like in the in Mumbai or Delhi? I'm not sure about Mumbai, but I lived in Delhi. Like, you cannot see stars. Because it's like too polluted or like too, like it's not very dark in night because like it's a big city and like lights are on. So I guess you mm. cannot see stars. Like same in same with Bangalore. I live in Bangalore right now. Like is it possible in Stanford to see the stars? Is it, is it that dark there? Uh, so you have to go a little bit outside the camp, uh, outside the campus. But the campus is huge. So like there's a huge. Uh, there's this place called the Stanford Dish, which is a fun place to hike at. So if you go there, it, you can't, I don't think you can technically go there at night anymore, but the student observatory is really close to that. And so that's a little on, on a hill, a little bit away. And so when you go there, it's, you know, it's like you're very close to the city still, but it's very uh, bright. And 
uh, clear. So you can, uh, yeah, so you can, uh, yeah, so from there you can see, uh, you can see stars pretty well. And you know, they have a full observatory there. You can take a class at the observatory. I did that when I was a sophomore. And uh, so you can definitely see stars and stuff over there. Uh, occasionally people see coyotes or mountain lions on campus. Like once in a while you, you would get an alert saying mountain lions sighted at the edge of campus right near where the mountains come. Uh, mm -hmm. So occasionally you'll see star, you'll hear stuff like that. And then when you're walking around, you'll see like rabbits and raccoons and everything. So it's close to a lot of cities, but it's very suburban as well. Like the people joke that the campus feels like a country club, but it kind of does. There's also like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like, did you play any sport there? Uh, not competitively, but I did, you know, I mean, I grew up playing squash, so I played some of that. Uh, when I was in, um, doing my master's, my department had a, my department had like a football, like soccer, uh, like game, like we, not, not full on league, but we just have a group of us play uh, football or like soccer every, like every week. Uh, I used to like, uh, yeah, I used to like, uh, you know, swim and go to the gym quite a bit because they had a bunch of stuff, a bunch of that. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, those are the main ones. I mean, uh, if you wanted to, you could take part in intramural basketball or soccer or another sport, or you could join a club sport team. So, uh, you know, like I had friends who joined the squash team and there were friends who joined like the tennis club team or like were on the uh, swim team as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, you can do like stuff for fun, uh, doing it competitively, like at a varsity level is pretty difficult because Stanford is a top, uh, varsity school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think wins, the, I think wins the, uh, what the, what did they call it? I think they call it the director's cup every year for like most titles and has won it for like the last 22 years running or something like that. So, uh, playing at the varsity level is pretty tough just because it's a, they play at a very high level, but, uh, I've had friends who are athletes and who were recruited to play on those as well. Mm -hmm. like what kind of opportunities exist for undergraduates to work on research or academic projects with professors? Oh yeah, there's a ton of those. So like, uh, and you can do it. You can do it from freshman year onwards. Like, I worked at uh, Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. So it's mm -hmm. a huge particle accelerator that's technically on the Stanford campus, but is run as a national lab. So it's funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, so I worked there my fresh between my freshman and sophomore year. Uh, and I was doing research on uh, nonlinear optics. So basically creating a system for magnifying, for uh, basically stacking a bunch of laser pulses together that you could use for super high resolution imaging of, you know, things like proteins or new molecules, that kind of thing. So yeah, I got to do that as a freshman. Uh, there's a ton of those. Uh, there's also a ton of opportunities for original research. So there's like scholarships to go, you know, study uh, scholarships if that or like grants that you can get for making say uh films or studying uh, one of my friends studied uh french moroccan literature so she, they gave her they paid her like you know six thousand dollars to go study that uh for a while and then on top of that there's uh you know there's a ton of uh there's a ton of other like you know internship programs that are easy to get because companies come to recruit quite a bit but uh yeah in terms of research you can do a ton uh and all you need to do is basically find a professor who's willing to be your mentor for it. And if you have an interesting project and then uh, usually you'll be able to secure some funding through there. When I was doing my master's, I was studying how you can uh, restore, uh, you know, critical ecosystem, coastal ecosystems like coral reefs or marshes and mangroves and use them to protect coastlines from hurricanes and storm surges and other kinds of, and, you know, sea level and sea level, other kinds of coastal hazards uh, like sea level rise. And so the research for that was funded by the Nature Conservancy, this like pretty well, uh, this very well known nonprofit. So there's a lot of stuff like that. And then on top of that, you know, there's some of the study abroad programs uh, have like an internship or like a research component as well. So I did the pro the pro the Stanford and Washington program my junior fall quarter. And as part of that program, you do an internship during the day in DC and you take classes at the Stanford House over there uh, in the evening. And so I got to intern for uh, Congressman Bill Foster, who's the only uh, scientist elected to the U.S. Uh, Congress right now. So I interned mm -hmm. for him when I was a junior and then took classes in the evening that were taught by very high profile people, uh, you know, including uh, like a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, uh, an attorney for the U.S. Uh, Department of Justice, Civil Rights Division, and uh, a very well known like presidential historian, among other people. 
So there's a ton of opportunities for research and in like you know internships and just meeting very interesting people. Mm. So what kind of internships are available on campus? Uh, yeah. So it's uh, so I mean so if you're working on campus, obviously there's a ton of research stuff. Uh, beyond that, I mean a lot of companies recruit very heavily. So uh, there's so Stanford being in Silicon Valley, there's always some startup looking for uh, students to come intern with them for the summer. So uh, I know a lot of people who work. So I I interned for. Uh, I interned for this clean energy startup accelerator between my junior and senior year called Cyclotron Road. They're based in Berkeley. Uh, and, you know, but a lot of my friends I know also worked at, you know, Google, Facebook, uh, all the big tech companies, a lot of smaller startups. A lot of them worked for venture capital firms. A lot of them did like policy work or other kinds of work like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's basically a very big variety. You can also, uh, uh, yeah, you can also, uh, you know, you can also like just find, uh, you can also just get resources to like work on your own startup mm -hmm. uh, idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, yeah. Mm -hmm. So and you can also find. Yes, no, I was saying yes, you can also find a ton of resources to work on your own startup idea. So there's fellowships that a lot of VC firms that are uh, close to campus will uh, provide for students like, uh, I mean, there's one called the Mayfield Fellowship. Another another fund called Lightspeed Ventures uh, will like also like you know pay for give you a stipend for the summer while you work on an idea and then potentially fund it as well. So there's a ton of uh, there's a ton of programs like that. So what do you feel the most exciting or effective environment would be? The most exciting and effective environment would be for studying. For studying. Uh, Stanford is probably like one of the best places for that. So I think the thing that really like stuck out for me like was that the culture is such that you're encouraged to find your own niche uh, and uh, you know become really good at it. And so it's less, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. So agree. And so basically, you're encouraged to find your own niche and become really good at it, as opposed to you know like getting very good at everybody getting very like you know into a very competitive for the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a great learning environment for that reason because you're not really like fully level up, uh, you know, in all ways, and uh, yeah, you're allowed to fully develop in all ways and uh, go from there. Yeah. So how do you respond to expectations? Uh, respond to expectations from expectations set by whom? Like it could be from anyone now. Like yeah, but like, so like from your peers. Yeah, so you so one thing, one cool thing about Stanford was that everybody helped each other out a lot. Like for example, uh, there were many times when I was struggling with my physics homework, and mm -hmm. uh, you know the uh, one thing that really helped over helped help me was. You know, there was always going, but there were always a ton of students, you know, who might have got stuff done, but then would take a couple of extra hours to help me, help me out, and you know, help me work through it, that kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Another uh, thing, uh, they also like a lot of this, the a lot of the TA, the TAs, the teaching assistants for your classes, and the professors themselves will have mm -hmm. office hours where they encourage you to come and discuss the homework with them. So I think in mm -hmm. school in India, you're often encouraged to you know just sit down on your own and try to figure it out, and you know, break your head, and then. Just turn it in like that. It's a lot more collaborative at uh, at Stanford, and I imagine a lot of other U.S. universities. But at Stanford, it felt particularly more so because uh, they really want you to learn and really want you to do well. And so they people will. There's a lot of resources to help you out if you need if you need it. And people usually take it because you know you're not working on easy problems. Right? You're usually studying stuff that's pretty intense. And so there's always a lot of resources to help you out for it. And yeah, there's a lot of expectations. People put a lot of pressure on themselves uh, because they're there. But there's also a lot of resources that help you, you know, manage those well. So, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, whether that's counseling or whether there's just things that help you, you know, take a break or, you know, things that help you do your homework or assignments better. Uh, there's always a ton of resources to help you out over there. So it's a very nurturing environment in that way. So what was your biggest challenge at Stanford? Yeah, so I had a couple actually. So one obviously was, you know, just getting settled in uh, because of, you know, because of the culture shock and everything. 
you know, there it is a very different environment that way. It can be a little, you know, if you're a little introverted, like I was at that time, it can be a little hard to make friends, but eventually it happens. Uh, I found people to generally be pretty welcoming. And, uh, you know, once you may, if you yourself make a little bit of an effort, you'll find that it just, you know, snowballs and all of that. So that was a big challenge. Uh, I did have a major injury my freshman year. Like, uh, so that was, so just getting around, getting accustomed to campus with that was a little difficult. Uh, mm-hmm. Academically, uh, you, I definitely struggled a bit when I was a sophomore and taking a lot of like the fun, the foundational physics classes because, you know, those, they weren't easy classes at all. Uh, it's known to be a pretty tough, pretty tough department. And I think a lot of other students can mm-hmm. uh, relate to those. So I think those are the two main challenges. Uh, I also got very thrown off because I was having a hard time doing, you know, these physics classes, but I'd always wanted to be an astrophysicist. So I was just had a lot of self-doubt as a result. And I was wondering, okay, am I actually going to be able to do it? But eventually, like, you know, I figured out a way to actually learn it. Uh, in some classes, I might not have got the best grades, but I think for further down the line, it did, honestly did not, did not really matter much. And so by the time I, like, I was like midway through my junior year, I was very well settled in uh, socially and also like, you know, was very happy academically and with the direction I was going in. So those were like two of my two main challenges. Uh, I don't think they're uncommon. Like I know a lot of students who had issues with both of them. Uh, and it's just part of the things you prepare yourself for when you uh, go to any university, whether it's Stanford or somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? And what is your ultimate goal in life? Yeah, so the main thing I'm really passionate about is climate change and uh, addressing it. And I, you know, I'm an entrepreneur right now. I do want to slide. I do want to be in, I do see myself being an entrepreneur for, uh, you know, for a long time, like, and starting multiple businesses that can tackle, uh, like, can tackle the climate change problem. So uh, in 10 years, I kind of see myself still working on that. I don't know if I'll be in, San, in the Bay Area or if I'll be, uh, you know, back in India or somewhere else. But I do wonder, that's the kind of work I want to be doing for most of my, for my life. So kind of like being, being like a, being like a climate tech entrepreneur. So like, are you like, you are, I mean, so you are basically trying to build a renewable source of energy. Like, is that what you are trying to do? Kind of. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things to do when it comes to addressing climate change. Uh, my current company, High Tide, is working on climate change adaptation. So what we're doing is we're building software to map and predict what the impacts of climate change are going to be in cities around the world. So looking at how mm-hmm. things like sea level rise, how, uh, you know, like storm surges, and then ultimately things like, and then, you know, in the future, we're going to build out stuff for things like wildfires and so on, how those are going to impact uh, cities, uh, how they, how, how those are going to impact cities physically. So, you know, uh, like have a physical, like basically like quantifying the physical risk and where, you know, creating that product for investment funds, governments, and so on at the moment. So uh, that's kind of what I'm working on right now. But uh, there's a ton of other problems that I'm interested in that I probably would go into whenever I, whenever I end up wrapping up this company and, you know, getting it acquired or something. So uh, other problems there are uh, that I'm interested in around this are carbon sequestration. So, you know, sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and locking it into, locking it away somewhere so it doesn't contribute to global warming anymore. Uh, the energy transition, so transitioning to like a Z, like a carbon neutral or like even carbon negative energy system, and you know like there's a ton of things that need to be done for that. Uh, you know another big problem is around this whole space is in agriculture, so reducing emissions that come from agriculture, and similarly reducing emissions that come from transportation and manufacturing, uh, creating like the right kind of financial products and structures that can incentivize all of these things as well. So there's a lot of stuff to be done in climate tech. I'm kind of interested in most of it. The ones that interest me the most right now, obviously, are climate adaptation, because that's what I'm working on right now. And then along mm-hmm. with that, also carbon sequestration through, uh, you know, like afforestation and through restoration of critical ecosystems or through mm-hmm. uh, other things. And then stuff around the energy transition as well, like creating a new kind of electric grid or creating a financial structures to deploy solar and electric vehicles much better in places like India, where you have a huge demand for energy and uh, mobility, but you don't really have a great supply at the moment. So that those are like the kinds of problems that interest me interest me in this space right now. Nice. Last nice question. So like if you could give an advice to 11th grade review, what would you give? Uh, I tell him to like uh, stress, I tell him to stress less. Uh, because, 
I tell him to stress less uh, because uh, and you know focus on developing fully as a person because I think there's a lot of pressure on kids that was in my time and I think it's gone up even more. Uh, I think it's gone up even more since uh, you know since I applied to college, and uh, yeah the uh, and yeah so I think I would tell you know tell him to you know like focus on what what he, what he's really passionate about and I, this is what I would extend to like everybody applying to college right now. Focus on what you're really passionate about and try to make it uh, unique about present of it, you know, present who you really are when you're applying to colleges. Uh, there's always going to be a ton of people with top grades who are like, you know, and who are also like, you know, head boy or school captain or school government president or whatever, uh, who mm -hmm. are applying and who've done, you know, these all these very standard extracurriculars. But you, 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 you're, but, you know, everybody has like something in, unique to bring to wherever they go. So get your grades over mm -hmm. a baseline and then, you know, do stuff that will you know, really like help you develop as a person and help you get into university. And also remember that at the end of the day, I mean, going to a prestigious university definitely has a lot of benefits. I mean, I went through it. There's a reason I ended up going to one, uh, but it's not, it's far from the end of the world. If you don't end up going to one, there's a ton of smart people you'll meet once you graduate and you start uh, working who've, you know, gone to like not, you know, not great schools and end up being very, very successful people. A uh, great example is this guy, Larry Ellison, the guy who founded Oracle and who, uh, you know, you, who's a very avid sailor as well and kind of revolutionized uh, the sport mm -hmm. of sailing. Uh, you know, once he became like a, once he became like a really wealthy guy, he went, he went to the University of Illinois and which is, and dropped out before he graduated, I think as well. So like, he's one example and there's a ton of others who are, uh, there's a ton of other other entrepreneurs who are like that. Uh, Stephen Chu, who I mentioned earlier, is a Nobel laureate, a groundbreaking mm -hmm. physicist, and former Secretary of Energy. He went to the University of Rochester as an undergrad, and now he's you know like at the top of his game. So remember that if you don't go to a prestigious university, it doesn't it doesn't really like define anything about you as a person, uh, or mm -hmm. as or even like say anything much about how uh, smart you are. It just means that for whatever reason that university decided that you weren't a good fit for that year and there's a lot you can do and your life is just starting you can do a ton more and really like make mm -hmm. a mark regardless so yeah i'd say don't uh, you know don't don't take too much tension uh, focus on what you're really passionate about and what really drives you and mm -hmm. uh, you know move from there uh, you'll be able to like make an impact and do live a, like live pretty well regardless so yeah that's the advice i would give to 11 year old me and everybody else Thank you, Arno, for your time. Like, it was really nice talking to you. Likewise, thanks, sir. Thanks for having me on, sir. Yeah, like I think it's evening day, right? So you might have things to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like it's morning there, so in morning, you know, like you cannot speak so much. Like. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very early morning for you right now. Yeah. yeah. Are you done recording? Yeah. I will stop recording now. Yeah.